Good afternoon, one and all. Welcome back from lunch. You are now uh, here to join us on our panel discussion uh, on, um, let's see what the title says, The New Social Compact and Policy Implications for Work. It's been two and a half days of discussion on the topic of work, um, and I hope that uh, you find find it, finding it interesting. Um, let me just remind us of some key takeaways. First, we started out by recognizing that there are five key trends that's reshaping the future uh, of work. The first, digitalization. The second, demographics. We're an aging society. The third, divides. The worry about how work may exacerbate income and wealth divides. The fourth, clearly, deglobalization where with COVID and even before that, there's an impetus among businesses to reshore that activities and therefore drive many of their business activities back to uh, where the markets are. And the fifth, decarbonisation. Isn't it only every day that we read about the climate uh, emergencies that we see around the world? So thankfully, there's an impetus to, uh, among businesses to transition to more green processes. And in the same way, there's an expectation that workers are able to make those transitions or also themselves be history makers, right? To develop uh, processes, technologies, markets for green technology and green products. So here we are at this session. We talk so much about education as a way to get workers uh, ready reskilled, upskilled for these trends. Uh, and then we also talked about how to do this, how to persuade them. And therefore, we looked at the role of unions. Uh, that's a very special focus that IPS has taken this year to really give uh, a spotlight to what unions can do. And there we had the Secretary General Ng Chi Ming talk about not just the 30,000 foot strategies for helping Singaporeans be ready for the future of work. But he talked about going to the ground and going from even the company to company to convince them to set up corporate training centers, for instance. We've heard about platform work, which has become far more popular, something that bridges the cap for many workers in Singapore today. And of course, recognize that at the end of 2022, uh, there was a committee that made uh, recommendations for how platform workers can be better taken care of, uh, whether it's in terms of workplace injury, retirement planning, and certainly representation. So I'm very, very glad that we've had a rich discussion this morning, and now we've come to a panel discussion on pulling all these things together and looking at the big picture of the structures that will determine the future of work in Singapore. Big picture, we have Mr. Rajiv Pashavriya, who is a leading thought, uh, uh, um, uh, well, a thought leader on uh, talking about change management and what leaders have to do. I'm very glad that he'll be able to share with us his thoughts on what that relationship between businesses who are in the business of making profit, right? who are in the business of being creative to create new products and services that are needed, who are in the business of really transforming the world. What leaders can do to respond to the changes and the trends that uh, uh, we just talked about. So we have Rajiv to go first. And then we have another key uh, huge framework that determines work in Singapore, which my second speaker will address, Dr. Intan, who is also herself an expert in change management. Uh, she is at the Singapore Institute of Technology, is going to talk about that fundamental pillar of what determines who works where and who gets rewarded how. And that's our concept of meritocracy. So that's the second piece that I think she'll uh, address today. And the third, Miss 
Yo Wan Ling, who is at NTUC and heads up uh, the special division that looks at uh, issues to do with SMEs, small, middle, middle and medium-sized enterprises, and women. And Monsieur is going to address one more key structural issue, which is really gender relations in the Singapore workplace. Okay, so with that quick introduction, let me just uh, um, invite uh, Rajiv to deliver his discussion about the future of industrial relations and what the corporate sector needs to do to take us to the future of that. So over to you, you have 15 minutes, Rajiv. Thank I think you. you'll speak from the rostrum. Thank you very much. So. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, before I, uh, before I uh, get into the topic of today, allow me to take a second to tell you about the organization that I represent. Uh, so I am from Stewardship Asia Center, as you can see. What is Stewardship Asia Center? We are a thought leadership center that does research, executive education, and advisory services on the idea of stewardship. And we define stewardship as creating value by integrating the needs of stakeholders, society, future generations, and the environment. And we call out each of those separately because in today's days of existential challenges, we need to take care of not just today's generation, but also our future generations. So that's what Stewardship Asia Center is all about. Now, much is discussed these days about creating in inclusive employment, sustainable livelihoods, ESG, and a more compassionate meritocracy. Rightly so, because the nature of work has indeed changed. Job security is a thing of the past. Remote and hybrid work is here to stay. The gig economy is slowly but surely encroaching upon traditional full-time employment. And the skill gap created by digitization is alarming. The good news is that governments, businesses, and the education sector are doing their best to respond. Tax and labor laws are being rewritten as we speak to enable trouble-free remote and gig work. And all sectors are hard at work to bridge uh, the skill gap caused by the digital divide. However, there is one area that I'd like to focus on today, which is DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, which could use, I believe, an upgrade. Now, DEI has become a key consideration as businesses are becoming more socially conscious. That's a good thing. But if we can fix a few outdated mindsets when it comes to DEI, I think we will get a better bang for buck. Uh, let me explain. When we think about, uh, when we think about diversity and inclusion, we think about it in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, and ability. One area of diversity and inclusion that nobody talks about is the extent to which I, as an employee, want to be engaged. So yes, employee engagement is the holy grail right, right now. But if you want diversity and inclusion, do you want to ask me to what extent do I want to be engaged? And will that be detrimental to the interest of business? We'll talk about that. And second, when we talk about equity, we think equal is always good. Now, conventional wisdom says that men and women must have equal opportunities, as must people of different races, ethnicity, or sexual preference. It also says that everyone should be held to the same equal standards, and performance must be measured and rewarded by those same equal standards. What we fail to overlook here is some employees don't want equal opportunity and don't want to be treated equally. So those are the, some of the things that I'd like to tease out today. Let's take a closer look. It has been proven beyond doubt that in a group of 100 or more employees in any organization, performance falls on a bell-shaped curve. Roughly 20% of the employees uh, are high-performing workers for whom their work is their main purpose. 60% of them are solid citizens who take pride in their work, but work is not their only priority. And about 20% of them work just to live. That is, their real passion lies somewhere else, but they need to work just enough to pay the bills. Now, with employee engagement being the holy grail, management totally ignores this reality that there are three different segments of employees. 
while trying to address employee engagement. Uh, it is assumed that high employee engagement translates to high organizational performance. Uh, so corporations must make every effort to ensure every employee is as highly engaged as possible at work. Millions, therefore, are spent every year on conducting employee surveys and addressing the gaps. Each year, new initiatives are launched to engage most, if not all, employees, but beyond a point, employee survey scores <coughs> don't improve. Why? Because based on the aggregate scores of survey questions, one size fit all cliches are employed to make everyone happy, whereas the needs of individuals, particularly in those three segments, are very, very different depending on their situation. By treating everyone equally, we end up wasting a lot of well-intentioned time and resources without achieving intended results. Ladies and gentlemen, the point is, equality is not equity. Imagine the following conversation between boss and employee. Hey boss, thank you very much for the bonus letter. Thank you very much for all the promotions you've given me in the last few years. Uh, I've worked very, very hard. I've given it my all to this company and you've treated me fairly and I've been a top-notch performer, thank you for recognizing that. But as you know, I just became a parent, and for the next year or two, I'd like to step off the gas a little bit. I'll still do good work, I'll still make great contribution, but I may not be a top-notch performer, and it's okay if you don't promote me or give me top dollar bonuses while I do that until I come back in the top bracket. Is that okay, boss? Imagine this conversation. Does such a conversation ever take place? Hell no. Why? Because it's absolutely taboo to talk even about stepping off the gas, even momentarily. Uh, why is that the case? What is wrong with that conversation? Now take this one click further and imagine this conversation. Hey boss, I want to be honest with you. I like this company, I like working here, but this job is not my main passion. My first love is music <coughs> and drama, but I need a job to pay the bills. So can we agree, boss, that I will do whatever is needed for the job and no more. Can you please give me minimum work in return for minimum pay? I will fulfill all the requirements of the job, but not much more. I also agree, boss, that if you believe that I'm falling below the minimum requirements of the job, I may be fired without any questions. Is that okay, boss? Another honest conversation that never takes place. Why? Because of the stigma attached to being a so-called low performer. The fact is, different employees have different life situations and preferences, and they are totally okay for not being treated equally. Now, another fact of the 20-60-20 curve is this. It's called the 80-20 rule, which says that the top 20% of the people produce 80% of the results. This was proven by Wilfredo Pareto in 1906 and has not been debunked ever since. Whichever field of work you look at it, the 80-20 rule is still alive. 20-60-20 is just an extension of the 80-20 rule. So if the return on effort is so different between the three categories, should we be using aggregate employee survey data to decide how to motivate everyone? Or should we try to better understand the needs of the three categories and address them as such separately? Let me ask you this. If we take an employee survey of all 100% of the employees uh, and average out the scores for each question and each category, what happens to the voice of the top 20% that produce 80% of the results? It obviously gets drowned under the voice of the other 80%, isn't it? And oftentimes, the ones who are the working the hardest don't even have time to fill out the employee survey. And if you use that aggregate data now to address employee survey uh, concerns uh, with one-size-fit-all measures, are you promoting excellence or are you promoting mediocrity? So this is not just talking from an employee's perspective, also from the employer's perspective. Uh, are we promoting mediocrity or are we promoting excellence? Think about this. There is a solution, and the solution is a very simple one. Instead of trying to make everyone a high performer, we need to accept the reality of the bell curve and give employees the freedom to choose according to their contribution. Uh, choose how much they want to work, how little they want to work, and pay them according to their contribution. We absolutely need the middle 60 and the left 20% too, because without them, the performance of the organization will be incomplete. 
Uh, these are not lazy or low performing employees. They have different needs that require them to balance the time and effort they put into their jobs. So instead of stigmatizing the so-called average or low performer, why not legitimize the curve and allow employees to choose how much or how little they want to work and pay and reward <coughs> accordingly? The normal concern when you do something like this, when you suggest something like this, is productivity will go down. Everybody will move to the left of the curve. Don't worry. The rightmost top 20% will prioritize and choose work over everything else, and they will produce 80% of the results. Uh, so 80% of performance is already guaranteed and protected. And since the one-size-fits-all employee engagement efforts will be replaced by tailor-made responses for the three segments, the voices of the topmost 20% will be heard rather than drowned, leading to even higher productivity by them. And since we will have re removed the stigma of the remaining 80% as low or average performers, they will also work with more happiness and less stress. So overall productivity will go up, not down. My friends, I have tried this personally with large teams of hundreds, even thousands of people I have led in many countries over my 22-year corporate career before consulting. And I can assure you, giving freedom leads to higher productivity because most employees accept that with freedom comes responsibility. They understand that if they breach the trust given to them, the freedom will be taken away. So they think and act like owners and take responsibility. They treat their jobs as their personal business and do what they need to do to protect their bottom line and their freedom. I have almost never been let down because of empowering employees with freedom to choose. The logic is sound and it has stood the time, test of time since 1906. So why don't most managers and most organizations practice leading with freedom? Because of insecurity. To give freedom and trust, you need to feel self-confident first. Before you do something to others and tell others what to do, leadership says, take a look at yourself and see if you are comfortable in your own skin. And that's a prerequisite for this kind of leadership. So that's one argument. Take this one step further. We, if we, in today's day and age, in today's economy, we cannot give job security, right? Because there's no such thing as lifetime employment then why do we insist on one job loyalty? If we can have employee contracts that say, this is what we expect you to do, do it whichever way you want to, why not allow them to have more than one job? This idea that, that you know, moonlighting is evil. In today's digital economy, where work is hybrid, work is remote, technology-enabled ideas, uh, as long, people, people can do five jobs as long as they're delivering what they said they would deliver for your company. So creating a gig-like atmosphere, even for full-time employees in the company, is something else to consider. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would say that to do all of this, to do all of this and make this a reality, we need a different kind of leadership. One that creates economic value by integrating the needs of stakeholders, society, future generations, and the environment. In this form of leadership, business leaders see themselves as stewards of the planet, of planet Earth and society, and have a genuine desire and persistence to create a collective better future for all sections. We call such leadership steward leadership, and this is my final point today. Uh, Steward leadership is what we need to address the concerns not just about the future of work, but about society and planet Earth's existential challenges like climate change and income inequality. How do you practice steward leadership? We have studied organizations for the last eight years around the world that do well, that excel at doing well by doing good, and we find that the first step is to integrate four values, specific stewardship values in a company's values, and those are interdependence, my success depends on yours, and vice versa. Long-term view, it may be hard in the short term, but in the long term, we are gonna be more successful. Ownership mentality, I choose to do business the stewardship way, and creative resilience, we will continue to find innovative solutions to drive growth without jeopardizing the interests of society, and we will not give up in doing so. First step, integrate these four values within the culture. Second step, based on these values, give the organization a stewardship purpose. A stewardship purpose is different from a regular purpose in that it creates a collective better future. And then finally, step three is when the rubber hits the road, 
now that you have your values and your purpose, make sure everything the organization does, from strategy to execution to hiring to firing to pricing, everything, every decision runs through the lens of the steward leadership compass. So that's basically uh, all I needed to cover to summarize the solutions to one of the questions before us today. What can we do in terms of policy and practice to create a more inclusive and sustainable workforce? I would say educate managers to lead with freedom of engagement instead of rigid one-size-fit-all rules and policies. Shed the outdated one-job loyalty mindset. Redefine how performance is measured and compensated and make performance compensation totally transparent. Treat employees unequally but honestly based on their engagement choices. And finally, develop the practice and capability for steward leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you for your rather controversial set of ideas. I see that uh, they are fundamentally hinged on the idea of a steward, stewardship model of leadership. We'll discuss that a little bit more. Meantime, let me just invite you, Intan, to deliver your uh, thoughts um, on what will reshape the future of work in Singapore. Thank you. You'll recognize Dr. Intan as a two-term MP. She was MP in Almokyo GRC, and at that time was a member of uh, the GPCs on education and uh, the economy. Uh, she's quite um, been dedicated and advocating for um, removing streaming in uh, Singapore's education system, primarily because it not only stigmatized people, but made them feel that there was a limit to how far they could go. So just uh, applaud you for all that work, Dr. Intan, and it's, uh, um, yeah, I'm going to grab the mic. All right, um, I should have worn heels today, I'm a bit short, but I hope you can see me above the rostrum. Thank you very much, Gillian, for this opportunity to share um, with the audience today. Um, I thought that maybe today I'd just bring you across five different um, areas which I thought could be a primer for our discussion later and something for you to ponder on and think about as we look at some of the policy implications for work in this new social compact. Right. Um, let me first bring you to what DPM Lawrence Wong uh, had shared uh, not too long ago, looking at the definition of meritocracy. Right. Um, I think, f for one, he mentioned that it is hard to disagree with meritocracy as a principle um, that upholds uh, fair opportunities for all, but it also is evident that um, meritocracy can, in practice, entrench privilege and inequality. I think most of us are aware of that, because we, if you look at just meritocracy on its own, looking at past achievement, past academic attainment, that can also be shaped by the circumstances that an individual um, is exposed to or has. Their social connections, um, social capital available, affluence and wealth of the family, um, even opportunities that they had for training to build on their capabilities. So the first uh, really is on, sorry, I just can't see so far. First really is on looking at not just a compassionate meritocracy, but if you can consider a meritocracy that is inclusive and representative. Some of you may straight away think about, are we now condoning affirmative action? I mean, more than anything, when we look at meritocracy based on merit, past achievement, past attainment, can we also look at embracing diversity and considering the circumstances that an individual was subject to growing up and probably even diminishing some of this, those opportunities that he or she could have had to prove themselves, to, uh, to uh, achieve or do better than what their peers could have had, right? Representative meritocracy. One, um, I just wanted to introduce this paper to you, Meritocracy and Representation, published not too long ago last year by um, Rajiv Sethi and Rohini Somanathan. I think it discusses very interestingly the concept of meritocracy and what we could do, especially in organizations and in employment. They even proposed a model 
that um, we could use looking at four aspects, ability and resources, which are not so immediately observable, but also on top of that, looking of course at training and group membership, which are more observable traits. Uh, interesting model, but also looking at the circumstances that an individual uh, is subject to. I mean, this is something that has been around for quite some time, but we don't quite put it into action. But if you look at one of the highest offices in the land, in Parliament, we do have some form of representative meritocracy. We have representation from different ethnic groups, representation from uh, individuals of, um, with or persons with disabilities. If you can do that in one of the highest offices of our land, why not through all levels and strata in society, in our organizations, in our companies? Not so much affirmative action with tokenism, but really looking based on merit. How can we ensure diversity, like what, Raj, um, that, like what was mentioned earlier? How can we ensure that in our organizations and companies? Second, mitigating privilege and entitlements. This was from a Singapore conversation, that, um, the example that I included here, that was done several years back. But interestingly, among the observations um, by the participants of the Singapore conversation is that some felt that meritocracy no longer serves Singapore as well as before, mentioning that probably alluding to the scholarship system, could we improve and enhance the scholarship system that we have? Uh, could it be that with the scholarship system that we currently have, meritocracy and competition could lead to a winner-takes-all society? Winners thinking little of others, thinking that I've arrived here where I am because of my own merit, my own abilities. Others who are not here, well, too bad. They didn't try hard enough or they didn't work hard enough. So can we look at how our scholarship system can be a lot more inclusive and representative even? I think we have to move away from allowing the scholarship system to be that golden ticket or pathway for scholars to just move ahead without having or without needing to compete and prove themselves on par with others. On a similar note, looking at how we can mitigate privilege and entitlements, again, we tend to look, um, especially when it comes to remuneration and employing employment, we look at educational attainments, academic qualifications. We've seen this before. I think this was done by Prof. Irene Ng, right? looking at um, salaries of graduate students, university graduate students, compare that to salaries of polytechnic graduate students okay. and ITE graduate students. Quite a stark difference in, among the salaries that they are able to um, have or be paid. But can we look beyond just degree qualifications alone? Can we look at potentially the, our ITE students, for example? I mean, I've taught them before in Polytechnic, even uh, now in SIT, quite a number of my students are from the Polytechnic route. They may not be the most articulate, they may not necessarily be the most eloquent, but they work very hard. They work very hard and they know where their priorities are. More often than not, they also have to take up responsibilities in the family. Studying, some of my students are also doing part-time job because they have to have that responsibilities towards their family, trying to make sure that they can support their families. So can we look beyond just academic qualifications alone? Um, at the same time, about those who are in our workplaces without an uh, educational uh, certificate like a degree, can we look at promoting them based on other forms of um, competencies and merit? Managing the young and the old in the workplace. Uh, it's quite an interesting article that I came across here, looking at millennials. Millennials and our Gen Zers, they tend to frequently switch jobs because they feel underpaid. Uh, they want their positions to give them the highest possible return on, this, on their investment. But while we try to make sure that our workplaces are inclusive and can cater to the needs and aspirations of millennials and Gen Zers, how do we also ensure that our older workers do not feel left out? How do we ensure that we are not just chasing after multiple experience in multiple different places, but that we can also value loyalty and those who are rank and file, who are of, um, you know, employees who are from rank and file positions, they've worked throughout the organization. Next is looking at performance evaluation in the workplace. Um, traditionally, when we appraise individuals in our workplaces, it's always been the reporting officer's evaluation of a particular person, of an individual. 
but can we also look at how we can assess them, not in the manner of how well they're able to manage upwards, but also how well they're able to manage sideways and manage downwards, people who are reporting to them. I think sometimes it's always easy to manage upwards and do what your bosses want you to do, but how well do you relate to your peers? How do you, well do you work with them? How well are you able to groom and provide opportunities for those who are reporting to you? I think there should be a more holistic way of a performance evaluation in the workplace. And finally, looking at internships and returnships in the workplace. I think there has to be a lot more opportunities for internships, not just for young people who are just joining the workforce, but for those who have probably taken a break because of caregiving responsibilities, because they are changing professions or changing industries. I think uh, NTUC mentioned about returnships from um, five years back, and I'm sure Monsieur Wan Ling later will talk about returnships, especially for women who traditionally are taking on caregiving responsibilities, but I hope in future we do not have to just cater this to women and that caregiving will really be a responsibility for both men and women towards their families. But more than anything, returnships for those who have taken a break because of familial responsibilities. So I leave that uh, with you, something to ponder on, something to discuss a little bit later, All right, and I hope that we, have, we will have a very uh, dynamic discussion later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Intan. Thank you for pointing out to us some of the shortfalls in the ideal, typical concept of meritocracy. Uh, of course, some of the points are familiar to all of us, but uh, I think the others, uh, uh, there are some that are fresh. I think, Rajiv, we're going to turn to you later to have a nice fight between you two. Uh, <laughs> because where you have commonality is you mentioned the need for a better, more effective way to evaluate performance. But in your model, it doesn't take into account, Rajiv, the fact that many workers come with certain constraints and deficits, and certainly deficits from further up the upstream. And so I think if uh, we were to take your extreme model, then uh, there may not be um, you know, the adjustments for these things which are necessary. So let's have a fight about it later. But meanwhile, where you left off, uh, Dr. Intan, about caregivers is certainly something that uh, Ms. Yeo will take up uh, uh, in her presentation. One thing, would you like to go to the rostrum? And uh, uh, yeah, yeah. One thing is a first term uh, member of parliament uh, in Pasiris Pongol, and uh, uh, I remember her best as the founder for Caregiver Asia. She set up a system to aggregate people who are uh, willing and putting themselves out there uh, to provide care services, right? Before exactly. that, you were with EDB. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, now you have the full slate of experience. We welcome you to share with us your thoughts for this topic. Uh, you have 15 minutes. Over to you, Wan Ling. Thank you so much, Jillian, um, for that introduction of my past, but I'm going to go back into past a little bit more. I was sitting out here and smiling to myself about how life has come full circle for me. Because when I went to table two, where I'm sitting, um, I met up with an old, old, old friend of mine. He's actually um, my lecturer in the university, Dr. Tan Eun Se. I think, right, you taught me about social stratification. And I was sitting here looking at another table, table 14. And I saw Dr. Pauline Strong, and she also taught me, and she taught me on sociology of the family. That was quite some time ago. I wouldn't say exactly how long, but it's definitely more than five years ago. <laughs> but I, I think this is a nice segue to what I was going to talk about today. You know, it's a different kind of social stratification, and it definitely involves the family. Um, it is something that has been living within our midst for many, many, many years, and decades even, and it's about how caregiving impacts women and women's role in the workplace. Um, I believe that if we do not address this, um, there will be two consequences. The first consequence is that we're going to create another social class out there of people who are unable to work because of caregiving duties, especially if um, Singapore right, is growing older. And the other portion is essentially about the very, very big opportunity that we're going to be missing out on. So this is what I'm talking about. 
Well, look at this, 260,000 women of economic age are not in the workforce. Can you imagine this? 260,000. I know that I'm in the midst, besides academics, that there are many taukes, a lot of employers here, and I'm sure when you look at this number, it's a number that you're actually salivating on. And if you think about how we can release 260,000 people in the workplace, think about, you know, all the, 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 the alleviating of um, labor stresses that we have in companies. And within this itself, I also do believe that there is um, a reason why this is happening. And if you look at many, many of the surveys that have come out on how the impact of caregiving is on females um, returning to the workplace or women or females staying in the workplace, you will see that there's actually a very, very big correlation between caregiving and actually another one that, well, it might seem trivial, but it's not so trivial, is actually housework, like vacuuming, <laughs> like cleaning the dishes and all that. So if you look at this survey that was released in May 2021, um, there are nine in 10 Singaporeans agreeing that household chores can be equally shared by the husband and wife, but actually, if you break down and look into this a little bit further, you will see that actually gender-defined roles still exist in the Singaporean household when it comes to household, uh, the household chores. So the study found that in reality, more women take on the daily responsibilities of cleaning and laundry. If I think about the amount of laundry I have to do at home, I have a really big sigh, okay? And these are tasks that take on daily attention. Men contribute by taking on household um, chores as well, but these are repairs and management of tech devices, and definitely these are not daily tasks. And, they, and the study also showed that less women, 54%, than men, 75%, were happy about their household and caregiving responsibilities. And this gap widens uh, with those with children, with 40 7% of moms saying that they are happy compared to 78% of fathers. And this brings me into this whole idea of how it is important for us to continue embracing something that the very terrible COVID brought to all of us. I won't wish another pandemic, you know, in our generation, but there was something during uh, COVID-19 that did bring a little bit of uh, a silver lining. And that is actually the idea of flexible work arrangements. So for some of you who have been following what the labor movement has been doing for many decades, we've actually been promoting the idea of flexible work arrangements for a very long time. And we all often had pushbacks from employers saying that this is not possible, it's not productive and all that. But lo and behold, during COVID-19, it was something that every single company globally actually had to embrace and that is the idea of flexible work arrangements and we do think that this has a very positive impact on women returning to the workplace. So if you look at the general statistics between 2019 and 2022, the employment rate of Singapore residents increased overall. However, for men, it increased marginally from 88.8% to 89.6%, but for women, this increased by almost three percentage points from 73.3% to 76.2%. And I believe that this correlation of women coming back to the workforce, besides them needing to do so because of perhaps the sole breadwinner or the main breadwinner in the family is not earning as much, or maybe being retrenched, but it also has to do with the number of establishments out there in Singapore offering flexible work arrangements. Um, and I do believe that Dr. Intan brought up a very important point. For us to continue with flexible work arrangements, it is important that we look at the aftermath of the adoption of FWAs, and this includes very good performance appraisal measures. 
So I want to talk about how we can be looking at making flexible work arrangements even more fair for women coming back to the workforce or even for any uh, worker who needs such arrangements in their lives. Um, there will actually be um, a set of tripartite guidelines on flexible work arrangements and this will be ready in 2024. Okay, the government aims to create a workplace norm where it is acceptable for employees to request for flexible work arrangements while maintaining the employer's prerogative to accept or reject this request based on their business needs. And within this itself, we had had the opportunity to hear from women on the ground via Every Worker Matters Conversations or the EWMC. This is a conversation that's happening within the unions, the labor movement itself, and where we actually talk to workers on what their ground fields are. So within this, we engage caregivers, women who want to return to work, as well as women who are existingly already at work and wanting to retain their positions in the workplace. The women have expressed great anxieties about their ability to manage work and caregiving commitments, and there are many existing policies encouraging our employers to voluntarily offer FWAs, but more needs to be done to ensure that this workplace supports the norm for all workers. I really believe that the dust hasn't settled on this. It's actually quite exciting times out there, especially for the HR practitioners amongst us. There hasn't been a lot of discourse on what it takes to ensure that there is, well, a and, I, and I totally agree with Mr. Rajiv, that there's actually personal stewardship when it comes to looking at how you deploy FWAs, and this is, more, this is both from the employers as well as employees' point of view. Also at the same time, I would like to say that there, is, uh, there was a paper that was put up um, during the conversations on Singapore women's development and within that paper itself, it highlighted that there needed to be sufficient support to balance work and caregiving. And this was actually a key concern uh, that actually attracted maybe about five or six different recommendations in that white paper. I would like to say that my team at the NTUCU um, Women and Family uh, has over the years advocated for women's interest in the workplace and indeed through the white paper itself we also came out with several different things that we think would be quite important for us to look at ensuring flexible work arrangements and women returning to the workplace get the adequate support that they need. So the first one is on better workplaces. Um, we did something quite interesting last year. What we did was try to make the whole entire workplace a friendlier workplace for mothers wanting to return to workplace. Uh, part of it was actually helping especially SMEs and unionized companies on creating workplaces that were friendly to women. But the other one too is actually creating the awareness and the discourse that's needed out in the society to ensure that people continue to talk about what kind of safer workplaces, what kind of more equitable workplaces we could be looking at. And under this Better Workplace campaign, what we did was that we fitted wellness corners or lactation spaces within SMEs and our unionized companies. And we believe that this uh, would allow a better work environment with tangible benefits for the employees. Also at the same time, under fair and safe workplaces, we recognize how SMEs lack the resources or know-how to deal with discrimination and harassment issues. What we did was that we conducted a whole series of seminars uh, to HR professionals as well as our branch officials on managing harassment. And one of the things that we think we need to do even more is actually to empower women to be able to articulate better the kind of harassments that they were seeing in the workplace. Another one that I thought is very, very important, and I think this is something that the labor movement will continue to champion, is actually rethinking job redesign such that it allows women to come back to work uh, in a more smoother as well as well-supported way. I'm not only talking about you know, the kind of flexible work arrangements, but job redesign that even goes into, for instance, uh, we have a company, Sitali, that actually does yutakuis. 
and Yuzakue comes out being very fluffy at the end of the whole process, but actually it's very heavy hauling. Essentially, you're lifting up sacks of flour. And so what Sitali did was that they broke up their 50 kilogram bags into 10, 15, and 25, allowing more people to come into the workplace without that kind of physical limitations. Another one which I really thought was very interesting was a company that's called Mother Care. <laughs> As the name suggests, they are very pro-employees who are mothers. And I was quite delighted that actually with mothers with young children were 40%, 40% of their new hires in 2021. And on top of that, within this itself, another half of these groups were women with three children or more. So who says retail isn't a suitable place for young mothers? It has to do with job redesign. So in conclusion, what we hope to do is that we hope to recreate as well as reimagine what our new social compact is and what is this agreement with all workers, including women wanting to return to workplace. We will continue to work with our tripartite partners um, to build a progressive and inclusive workplace and we also, help, uh, we also hope that with this, we'll be able to allow women to truly reach their potential both in the workplace as well as homes. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Wan Ling. Um, what you shared clearly uh, resonates because as we started the day today, uh, we shared what the IPS survey found about what Singaporeans want from work. Uh, the top three items were um, pay adequacy, workplace ethics and work conditions. Oh. And what you've described is a process where you've gone down to the ground and listened to uh, the constituents, the women, and then found companies that are willing through their ethics and values to accommodate the diversity that you were talking about, diversity and inclusion, Rajiv, and then set the work conditions that make it possible so that there is not a loss to Singapore that these women find it's impossible to work when they actually do want to work. That's right. So thank you so much for those stories. Um, I'm going to uh, you know, cut to some of the questions that we've received. And uh, this will certainly uh, take us back to where we started, Rajiv. Uh, but listen up, uh, Intan and Wan Ling as well. Uh, the first question uh, that I want to pick up is, um, well, it's disappeared. A lot of what the speakers <laughs> are saying require mindset change and yes. cultural shifts. Yes. Okay? Uh, I know you've addressed it in some way, but let's answer Anonymous' question. Uh, Anonymous said, well, how are you going to bring about, how do you make that transition to what you're talking about. Uh, you have a room full of uh, people, business leaders, civic leaders, uh, you know, civil servants, and students as well. What would you say to them would be the one thing you want to see happen so that what you've discussed, each of you, can actually uh, you know, really come to pass and uh, you know, bear fruit the way you uh, envisage it, okay? So, Rajiv, uh, please, you kick us off. So, in my humble opinion, there are two ways to change behavior. Okay. One is through policy and through regulation, rules, regulation, strictures. If you don't this, you will go to jail. Uh, if you do this, you shall be rewarded. So, carrots and sticks, more sticks than carrots, that's one way. Uh, and I believe that that is not the most effective way. Mm. Most countries, most companies, most organizations use sticks and to some extent carrots to drive behavior. What regulation and rules does is gives a floor that if you fall below this, you, there will be consequences. What it doesn't encourage is behavior at the highest level, which is what we need to save planet Earth and society and to address the needs of today's evolving workplace as uh, my colleagues at the panel have just said. For that, you need education. For that, you need values-based leadership. So I'm a big proponent of relying less on regulation and compliance and policy and more on educating people that there is a different way to lead. And values-based leadership will actually get you higher productivity and higher employee engagement at the same time. There is no need to use the big stick. 
Okay. Your starting premise is that you uh, see leaders valuing diversity and inclusion, but your working model uh, becomes a hyper-meritocratic one, where people, yes, define their performance and you pay strictly based on what they have the freedom to express and articulate. What Dr. Intan has, what Intan has highlighted and one link to, uh, is that there are structural barriers to people fulfilling their potential. So what you have discussed is what, where people are now, but it doesn't take into account what is the baggage they bring, what are the deficits they've suffered from, uh, and uh, therefore what are some of the um, uh, things that factors will pull them back in terms of their performance. Can you address that, please? Actually, there is no conflict between what they are saying and what I'm saying. We are in violent agreement, actually. Okay. What I'm saying when I say that we don't address the need for uh, an individual's needs for levels of engagement. I, I want to, I may be an employee, for me, my work is my purpose in life. All I want to do is work, 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 and I want to get rewarded accordingly. I may be a person who work is important. I want to give society and my, employ my company a good performance, but I also have other responsibilities, like I'm a parent, like I'm, a family is equally important to me. And in some cases, you know, I'm a fan of the arts. I just need to pay the rent. Just because it's that category doesn't make me a bad person. So I, we are actually in violent agreement. We need to address the needs of all sections. And the mathematical model that I was trying to present was actually saying, don't worry. If you address the needs of all three levels of engagement, your productivity will actually go up. And it won't be a cost. It would be a benefit. Okay. So we are in uh, violent agreement. No, no fight there. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if Intan agrees with you. Intan, please respond, but also take the bigger question of how would we... Uh, propagate, right, what you have proposed, your five-point plan, right, to kind of really change the paradigm on meritocracy, although on some points we're halfway there. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gillian. I concur with what Rajiv shared earlier. Um, you know, you need to have the policies, the framework, and then you need to also have uh, education. The three E's essentially, enactment of legislation and policies, and then you need to enforce it, and of course education, public education, uh, structured education, and so on. Um, but at the same time, when we look at, for example, in the workplace, in organizations, when we um, performance evaluate or appraise um, individuals, I think it's always easier and probably more um, accurate to look at quantitative measures, you know, what the person has um, attained over the past year of performance, what are the metrics involved and so on. But we also need to look more at, um, increasingly at the qualitative and anecdotal measures. Conversations that we have with our um, employees is not enough to just look at what's on paper, what the person has attained uh, or achieved over the past one year, but conversations with that person. Probably there could have been um, instances of um, conflicts or challenges in the family that the person didn't tell you directly, but which could have affected his or her performance. You know, those conversations, ongoing <coughs> conversations are important. Right? So we do not just look at just one facet of what a person is in terms of performance, but um, dig as much as possible what the person has actually gone through um, to better understand what were the circumstances that you could have considered in appraising that person more equitably, more fairly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. One thing, what about you? Your response to how we make the change? Uh, oh. I know you've demonstrated some yes, of it. Yes, that's right. But to take it further, what oh. do you think needs to happen? Well, so I'm from the unions, so I would say that there are two philosophies that are very important to us over at the unions. The first one is actually the philosophy of being pragmatic. And the second one is actually the tripartite partnership. On the pragmatism of it, I do believe that many, many companies, given the situation, the job crunch situation that we're looking at now, not enough workers, I do believe many companies are now looking to redefine what it is to work for their companies. And this could be flexible work arrangements. This could be looking at part-timing. You know, I even have companies, right, who come and tell me, hey, you know, previously I used to have one person working for eight hours, mm -hmm. but right now I've broken this job up to three workers for that eight hours, and it works well for them. So I do believe that pragmatism is a very, very big, um, I would say, motivator for change, especially for many SME 
uh, companies who are out there really looking to retain and attract talent. Now, on the tripartite uh, partnership, I do believe that um, looking at cultural changes is something that uh, the tripartite partnership can actually support our companies through. Um, and this is not just the company side, but also the employee side. Within this itself, I do believe um, that there are many, many different types of tools out there that can help companies when they decide to embark on this cultural change. One of the, the things that happened to me earlier this morning was actually I had a group of Tauke News get together um, over at the NTUC. These Tauke News were people, right, who managed to attract and retain talent throughout the whole entire COVID-19 period. And what we wanted was for these employers to come together to share the secrets of their success and how they were able to attract and grow even during COVID-19. And these were employers, Tauke News are females, right, <laughs> who actually um, were from all industries. We had retail industry, we had healthcare and all that. Um, and it, it, I, I do believe it's all these kind of sharing um, and how the tripartite partnership listens to this, that we're able to come up with good policies like what you mentioned. But the other one too, right, is how the unions, how the labor movement is able to also come up with really good programs that, in matter of what you're saying, is carrot or stick, to be the carrot to encourage such changes. Mm. For instance, the company training uh, committees that we have, that's a very, very good example of how we've been helping companies reshape um, their training, reshape their culture, especially right in the area of job redesign. So I do think that we're making very, very good headways okay. in this space. Thank you. Okay, people in the room, please get ready to pose your questions. There's one more question I'd like to cast to you that's online. Um, um, it got 90 votes, so... 90, wow. Well. <laughs> could you elaborate on how you think the scholarship system should be relooked or revamped? Students might not be as motivated to work hard academically. Should less importance be placed on results? So, um, I don't know whether we should really hone in just on the scholarship system, but since the question is there, put, we, we kind of respond to that. But I guess, what's the motivation to work? What's the motivation to go past mediocrity that you talked about towards excellence, if it isn't just a very obvious bright orange carrot at the end of it? Of course, pay adequacy came up as a top concern, uh, and what motivates, but you know, is there anything else? And pay being linked to merit in a very exam-oriented uh, fashion. Intan. Thanks, Julian. Uh, if I can just take this um, and just put, up, put in the link to our current government scholarships, PSC scholarships, I must say that kudos to the government. There's increasingly greater recognition of um, abilities and competencies beyond academic attainment alone. I think, for example, in recent years, uh, for PSC scholars, increasingly we see more who do not come from the traditional um, elite school route. Um, no offense to those who are in elite schools um, <laughs> okay, or brand name schools. But I think that's the recognition of wanting to ensure that there's a more diverse pool of uh, PSC scholars or scholars who will be helming positions of influence and authority in our civil service and our public sector. And I think that's important. We d like what Julian alluded to, we do not want to go down the route of mediocrity. I think certainly we do not want to because we want to ensure that those who helm positions of authority and influence, they and who will be responsible for making decisions that affect the lives of many in Singapore, they would have basic abilities and capabilities, competencies. Yeah. But at the same time, we want to ensure that it's beyond just academic attainment alone. That they not have just cognitive ability. That's right. Not just yeah. cognitive exam-oriented uh, uh, academic attainment only. Right. But they have had the opportunity to interact and work with people who come from less privileged backgrounds, that they have been able to demonstrate um, leadership oh. in um, positions, whether it's in CCA or in voluntary positions. But at the same time, they are also able to demonstrate um, instances where they are able to groom others, not just taking the helm of leadership, but also be able to build others up 
I think we want people who are, who are able to show qualities that we want to see in our leaders for each and every one of us. Not just those who are hate smart, but those who are also very strong in terms of our hard work. Okay. Right? And who are grounded, who feel the pulse on the ground. Okay. And I think that's what we need to put in place. It's certainly not a lot easier because like what I mentioned, we're moving away from quantitative metrics and benchmarks which are easier to monitor and follow and um, attribute to. But we are increasingly making it a lot more diverse in how we are appraising them, or how we are evaluating them, and uh, what are the qualities that we want to see in them. It's um, probably a lot more messy um, than what we are used to, but as any society progresses and matures, I think this is what's needed um, for people who are going to helm leadership positions and who will be in that position to make decisions that affect many of us. And if I could just step in, you know, I, I completely agree with you and I always think, right, that there is a very, very important role that scholarships and bursaries play in our society. It's quite interesting, over the last one month, I think, right, I've been to maybe about eight. Yeah, it's not just, uh, so EduSafe is one, uh, my EduSafe is coming up next month, you know, and I think it's going to take me a whole entire month yeah. to give out the EduSafe awards. And thank you for reminding me on that, because under EduSafe, there's also a program called um, Eagles Award. And this actually awards uh, our young sprouts who have exhibited good um, leadership skills, you know, wanting to give back to the community and all that. And I think it's a celebration of, you know, what makes um, a young sprout going to be a tall oak tree in future to shelter our community. So it's not just about academic excellence. But beyond that, right, I wanted to, to say that over the last one month, I've maybe been um, to about eight different bursaries and scholarship awards. And I was quite um, really heartwarmed by where the origins of all these were coming from. We were looking at this not only from the government, not from MOE, you know, not from the CDC's, the mayor's office, but we're looking at this coming from moral societies, um, Xiang Tengs. We were even like, I, I even attended one where a company, a company decided to come up with their own bursary and scholarship programs. Um, I, I definitely think that there is a big role uh, towards um, bursary and scholarships. Um, it does encourage um, students to do well. Um, but I do think, right, that it is also important that this, uh, the criteria for bursaries and scholarships are widened in a way that it fully represents and helps those people and families who are in the vulnerable situation. Okay, thank you for that. I think once we get past just exam grades, it becomes grey, it becomes not so clear, it's certainly not objective when you're going to start weighing up other qualities. So yes. I'd love for you to kind of say a little bit about that. In, uh, you know, Basically, the burden and responsibility we are placing on businesses and I guess these agencies uh, that look for yes, talent right. is, is much higher. It's a whole you, of Singapore effort, you know? Right, right, yeah. right. And, and so there is the grey which you need to assess, which is complicated. Yes. And then you said splitting one job to three people. Yes. It's a very heavy burden and price to pay. So, Rajiv, please tell us, how do you think business is going to respond to what we're saying this afternoon? And our leaders, if they're not born, how are they made? <laughs> so there's different kinds of leadership. Coming back to the question of, you know, is academic grades the only criteria uh, for selecting scholars? Well, I would say it's, and, and there's a lot of talk about emotional development and emotional intelligence these days, that leaders should be well-rounded, not only they should be cognitively smart, but also emotionally smart and all that. All that is fine, but I beg to say that sometimes we overdo this argument. Okay. You see, it depends on what are we preparing people for. If you're preparing somebody to, for scientific discovery, uh. then it's okay that they're not emotionally inept and they don't know how to mobilize people and work with other people. What are you preparing them for? If they are pure scientific pursuit people who are going to uh, give us uh, the solution to food and water once we hit nine billion people and it's all about the science, I don't care if they don't care, get along with people, it's okay. But if you're preparing the next prime minister, if you're preparing the next president of a university, they very well uh, need to know how to work with people. So I think we should be careful as to how we uh, frame these things in okay. the first place. So in some cases, just going by grades is okay. Right. Uh, but okay. in other cases, it won't be. Okay. 
You, you want to jump in quickly. Short <laughs> children, one. If, I, if I may, just uh, throw a little spanner in the works. Please. Um, even for, for example, the, the example that you cited, Rajiv, um, scientists working in laboratories, finding solutions for what, climate change, um, better sanitation. I think if you do that in a so-called ivory tower, and the only test un yeah, based on their theories and understanding of research work, but without understanding the pulse on the ground, without going down to understand sure. the needs of individuals or different communities, I think there will be a certain uh, deficit yeah, in, no in what they are proposing and the solutions that they're putting out there. And very often they have to work in teams as well. That's so right. some level okay. of emotional yes, and, and uh, it's intelligence. Yes, a degree. You see, yes. the, the, the it's how just much relative. of that is exactly. required? For sure. I mean, nobody exactly. can argue with what you're saying. The, the but, extent uh, of, of what are we looking for, not just okay. academic attainment and, and exam marks alone, but the extent of how they are able to work in teams. Because increasingly, the best solutions that we that we see are not those by individuals alone. They, okay. in, they come from teams, and usually a diverse team. Yeah. And, right. and you have to I tap into people's strengths, right? If the strength <laughs> is coming more from cognitive ability, then you compensate a little bit on the other side. Give them enough of that yes. that they need in order to collaborate for scientific discovery, but, uh, but, but capitalize on the strength. So I think, again, I don't think we are in disagreement. Uh, it's more uh, being more practical about how do you develop people. Okay, we'll come back to the business cost side of it. I really hope that we've now built up a lot of sort of uh, custom out there. Yes, uh, please line up uh, in front of the mics to pose your questions and, um, <laughs> you know, panelists get ready for, for uh, you know, a kind of live fire session. Okay, um, good afternoon panelists. I, kind of my question is for Ms. Yeo and Ms. and Dr. Intan, but um, yeah, uh, the other panelists can also chip in. Okay, um, well, I'm aware that this conference is about the topic of work. Socialization of gender roles is still deeply ingrained in our society, whereby women are still expected to act as caregivers for their children and aging parents. So in that case, how do you think that we can incorporate change in the mindsets of our people, especially children and teenagers today, to ensure that women of the future workforce do not have to face the problems that women of today's workforce face? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any more questions on the gender uh, angle to this? None? Okay, over to you, Wan Ling. Well, maybe if I could um, handle that, that question first, you know? Yeah, okay. Well, I actually think that um, we have come quite a long way. Um, over at the labor movement, the NTUC, we've, um, well, I'm the director of the Women and Family Unit, but this is a unit that has been around for, I think, close to 30 years. You know, we've been fighting the good fight for a very long time. Um, and I think we've made a lot of progress, you know, um, for instance, trying to close the gender um, pay difference. Um, another one is also uh, looking at the type of caregiving support that you can be looking at. Um, Back to what I was saying, I think we always take a very pragmatic approach to what's happening because we listen to the ground and we kind of like figure out what is it that the ground needs. You might be surprised to know, but the NTUC was actually uh, one of the first large scale childcare providers. You know, right now we know it as my first school, <laughs> but previously, right, back in the 80s and the 70s when it first started, uh, what happens, right, was um, this was the first large scale caregiving. Um, uh, uh, a program that we had. And I think, right, solutions like this really help to bring women back to the workplace and also at the same time, right, to take off some of the, the burden of care. Now, these are all, I would say, mm, physical, you know, services that we can provide. And of course, you know, if you look at um, what we're doing with NTUC healthcare site, you see that we've also started to build quite a number of aged care facilities because caregiving goes many, many different ways. But I think you're absolutely right uh, that caregiving or women matters shouldn't be in the realm of women. Uh, there are 50% of the world who are guys. <laughs> and, and I do believe, right, that men need to be equal stakeholders or at least, right, know what's going on in the day of the life of a woman. And within this itself, um, I think over the labor movement, we have been advocating for several things. The first one is looking at some form of parity when it comes to caregiving leave. And I think this is quite important, especially right in the beginning, when you kind of want to set the, I would say, tone for looking after your child. 
And so we're talking about uh, parental leave, uh, paternity leave, that is comparable to maternity leave. And within this itself, we hope that there could also be a very good discourse between men and women, fathers and moms, on how they share um, the initial first four months you know, of um, them having a child together. So I think that's a very important discourse. Another one too, I'm actually very, very encouraged by the number of civil uh, societies that's coming up, you know, to talk about fathers. Fathers for Life is a very, very good example. And it's also an organization that we work quite closely with. You know, it's celebrating fatherhood um, and the importance um, that fathers play uh, within right, the life of, of a child. So there are many, many movements going on. And I don't think that this is something that we can just, a snap of a finger, change. Gender, the way that we perceive gender, right? And I, I do think, right, that this is something that we need to continue to chip um, away on, not just only um, over at the unions, but also right in, in, in academic, in the way that we conduct our lives, um, in, in civil society. So these are all ways uh, in which we're doing this. And you know what, by you asking this question, I think right, you've also uh, participated right in giving this whole entire discourse um, a very good voice. Yeah. I hope uh, Ro Bottom feels that uh, your question has been answered. Mm -hmm. uh, Ro Bottom had said maybe we can all, also what's needed is for men to step up and engage in caregiving and maintenance of the household, yes. and also for employers to recognize the fact that men can and want to be caregivers as well. Exactly. Right. Uh, there is, you mentioned wage gap, the gender wage gap. Uh, so there is a question here. Um, there's still a persistent wage gap between men and women, often explained as the need to remunerate men for their two years in NS. How can we bridge that gap? Okay. <laughs> well, we, we are aware that there is um, actually, um, I would say, a difference in pay for certain types of uh, ranks of jobs in Singapore. And we're continuing uh, at the labor movement to actually uh, put light into this. However, there's something that I actually wanted to um, bring up. And again, it's a very practical and pragmatic consideration. Um, when we looked at the, the way, um, uh, the structure of how a female's career is vis-a-vis -vis a man's career, actually the female's career is not as linear as that of a guy's. I would say, right, it's a bit like this. And a lot of the times, it has to do with the family. And I think, right, the coming in and out of the workforce because of caregiving needs has given the arise to this gap. And I believe that the real question that we should be asking here is not so much on balancing the wage gap, but actually to ensure that if a woman decides to come back to the workforce after a rather long hiatus from the workforce, that she needs to be supported through this whole ent uh, entire process and not to be discriminated against. Okay. Now, over at um, the NTUC, we've been um, launching a series of programs in the constituencies, in the various constituencies, because we found out that a lot of women, when they come back to work, they face a couple of issues. One issue, a lot of people have been talking about this, is actually a skills gap. Okay. Right? So, Perhaps you graduated right with a degree in communications, but right now we're talking about digital communications. And I do think right, that there are many, many different, you know, uh, I would say Schemes. training programs Program. out there right, that allows you to upgrade. But I think right, there's another one that is a little bit more difficult to address, and actually that's the lack of confidence. Okay. I have many qualified women you know, who maybe even have masters, PhDs, but because they've been away, for 10 years, 7 years, you can calculate why it's 10 years and 7 years. has to do usually with PSLE. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. they, they tell me, oh, you know one thing, I, I really want to come back, but I, I'm scared. And that's where I think right, a series of mentorships are very, very important. And I believe right, that a part of it right, has to be about women supporting women. So we launched this right over in Pongo um, about two years ago. It was very, very well picked up because of the confidence uh, gap that we were trying to bridge um, with the mentorships and all that from union sisters as well as from grassroots leaders. Um, and What's I the think third one? 
And it's been launched right in 10 different okay. constituencies. What's the third gap? Okay, and I believe, right, that for the third gap, it's actually about employers. Employers, right, need to know that when you get a woman returner to come back to the workplace, well, her child is still a child. The senior is still a senior. The person that she needs to look after because is sick is still sick. You know, and because of this, it's important, right, that employers kind of look at how we job re restructure and redesign the job for women and to be supportive, not just like, nah, this is the way it is, is really actually letting the woman feel comfortable and they trust an employer. And really, I must tell you something, if the employer does this whole hand-holding process, the success rates of women being able to successfully go back to the workplace with you as the employer rises up significantly. Okay. I think it's almost 100%. And you said the business case is that we're very labor tight, exactly. so yeah. it would be helpful to the businesses too. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So, you know, if you need to know, you know, get reconnected with some of these employers who have done this very successfully, come and talk to me. Okay, we have a question over there, please. Yeah, please introduce yourself. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yoga from Raffles Institution. And I would firstly like to start by thanking the panelists for their really interesting sharing, especially on where we should be focusing our efforts on. So it seems to me like we are promoting a society that places a great emphasis on individuals and individuals really pursuing their interests, like such as the steward leadership and with compassionate meritocracy. So my question is, when we have a greater focus on individuals, do you think it will take the focus away from collective issues that we face as a society like climate change and sustainability? Thank you. Thank you for that. Anybody who wants to take it up? Yeah. I don't think, again, uh, there is an either-or situation here. Steward leadership says the basics of steward leadership is in the belief of interdependence, which, which is the belief that we cannot be successful until we make others successful. Mm -hmm. And the idea of taking a long-term view and taking ownership to collectively solve for these sorts of issues. So uh, I don't know if, if things like steward leadership or anything that we've discussed here is talking about promoting individualism as such, unless I got that wrong. I didn't hear that from either of you either. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. If I can jump in here, yes. Rajiv. Um, you're, I think we are not saying that we're just looking at individual achievements alone, but within um, appraising and, and evaluating the performance or abilities of individuals, we see how well they're able to work with others as well. Um, I think that's increasingly a feature in how we appraise and how we assess individuals. Um, I mean, even in whether it's in for scholarships, whether it's in uh, employment, hiring, we look at how they're able to work in teams, like what uh, Mr. Rajiv also mentioned earlier. Right? It's not just about individual attainment alone. Jillian, if I can just dial back a little bit okay. on the wage gap uh, between yes. men and women. Um, it's not just wage gap uh, alone. Um, if you also look at opportunities provided to women, I think that is just a, there's a lot to be desired. I think mm. we, we need to allow women to really step up to step up and be in positions of leadership, positions of influence and decision making. And for example, in the workplaces, if a woman starts to question a lot about why processes were done this way and that way, we tend to label her as being naggy. When a man does so, <laughs> he's being thorough. <laughs> so I think we need to move away from that. Let's not look uh, at a woman. When a woman does this, it's because it's that. When a man does it, it really look at the capabilities and competencies of women. Uh, I think even opportunities given to women to helm positions of leadership need to be a lot more. Um, I come from the university sector, so even look at our AU's academic universities, uh, autonomous universities in Singapore. We only have one female university president, Prof. Lili Kong. Mm -hmm. After what, what, 50 years of independence? What about other female academics that we have? They are competent, they are capable, but why do we not have more? in our senior management, in our universities even. Likewise for organizations, in the boards and in senior management and leadership, a lot more males, mm -hmm. and usually old males, I mean, not being an ageist, but I think there's, <laughs> there's a time when we need to know, we need to groom others who are young and coming up and make way. We can be mentors as we get older. I think it's something that we really need to look at and improve on, and I think we are, we are headed the right way so long as we know that uh, we're giving opportunities for those um, who probably need those opportunities and who are capable of those opportunities. This morning, we identified one more factor, which is that women do not know how to work loudly as opposed to how men do it. As in men given half a chance, they'll be able to actually present 
what they've been able to do through the job, through the work, and uh, women are a bit shy about that. So it was quite an inf but insightful... But you know what? I, th I think us women have our own ways. We don't need to shout about stuff. But, but exactly. nobody else knows. Yeah, I don't know. There are certain things I'm sure, like, you know, Dr. Intan and I can do that Dr. Uh, Mr. Rajiv can't. <laughs> what would they be? I don't know. Well, perhaps uh, rule the world from behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hope you all just uh, enter some views on Pigeonhole if you have some ideas. So we have another question on the ground. Um, can I please invite anyone else who has questions to please go straight to the mics now because we have about six minutes before the end. So please step up to the mics. Yes, introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Eza Fatin. I'm from uh, the Institute of Policy Studies. Uh, good afternoon, pan panelists, and thank you so much for everything you've shared so far. So my question is that, um, so participation in care is often economically devalued, regardless of the gender or nationality of the person carrying out this labor. Uh, arguably, performance in the workplace is affected by the Did different... Did you say caregiving just now? Uh, care work. I was oh, thinking, care work. Okay, care work. Yeah, I was reflecting about what you... I think Dr. Intan shared just now about people from different economic backgrounds uh, or in uni having to take part-time jobs or having different responsibilities at home and how social economic class also might play a role in that. Um, so... Arguably, performance in the workplace is affected by the different burdens of care work individuals have. How can we make care work more visible and increase recognition for it in the public sphere? Can we integrate that into how we appraise an individual's performance? If I can take that question. Thank you, Fatin, for the question. Um, interesting one. Um, like what I mentioned, yes, we need to look beyond just a person's uh, academic attainment alone in exams or high-stakes exams. Um, by having those conversations with, for example, in the workplace with our employees, what, or even with our students that we um, interview for admissions or for scholarships, uh, what have they gone through? What, did they, what are some of the circumstances that were different compared to another student? And I think this is where, um, like what um, Gillian alluded to, it becomes a lot more chaotic, a lot more messy, mm -hmm. a lot more grey because it's not so um, linear, it's not so structured, because you have certain check boxes that you're able to tick for this individual. But what are some of the um, other aspects of that individual that shows the, the characteristics or values or qualities of that individual? For example, a student who's working throughout his or her three or four years in university, I think that shows a lot of grit and resilience. But how do we measure that uh, in one single check box? Not so easy. But I think this is where we need to make um, accommodation to that. How do we, uh, how are we able to sort of um, pull that out, elicit that from that individual? And I think that's where the conversations, um, talking a lot more, not just during appraisal time, but throughout the year to fully understand where each person is. It's a lot more work, I, I know. Uh, and for a lot of our HR professionals and employers and bosses, they're thinking, this is adding a lot more to what I already have on my plate. Yeah. But I think that creates uh, a more um, inclusive uh, and, I would say, a more objective way of appraising um, individuals. Okay. And just to add to that, that's the point I was making earlier, that in addition to all yes. of that, you have to redefine what performance, good performance looks like. We have stereotypical ideas just like grades that, you know, a 99 percentile and 98 percentile. No, if different people, some people have caregiving responsibility, we should not say, oh, you spend less time at work and therefore you're a low performer. Yeah. We have to redefine what performance is yes. and allow people to contribute at the level they want to contribute at and no make them uh, sort of, you know, stigmatized. You, the way to handle the differences, somebody wants to give 100%, somebody wants to give a 30%, is to use compensation and rewards to, 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 to create uh, equity, uh, but don't demonize it. And l as long as we don't redefine performance, all this will just remain a conversation. Yep. And if you could just add something to this as well, I think, right, as a society, we're starting to really have a discourse about understanding how it is um, to recognize the efforts of caregivers. Um, there is actually a, a group of uh, women out there now who actually have zero, uh, zero CPF because right, they spend their whole life caregiving. And I'm very happy to see right, that the CPF has also started uh, to do a top-up scheme. So if someone tops up their CPF for them, they will also pay in equal parts you know, in the top-up to a certain amount, of course. But I, I think it's things like this that's important to start this whole entire discussion of how do we reward caregivers um, 
um, fairly and to create safety nets uh, for caregivers, right, at the end of, you know, when, when they start having caregiving needs themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's almost time to wrap up. We have one question on the floor and then uh, we'll, we'll ask you for closing comments. So please go ahead, introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Corinna. I'm from AWARE. Hi, Corinna. Hi. Uh, gender question. Um, why aren't we increasing the amount of days of paternity leave? There are not so many levers that we can have to actually um, promote gender equality in society and paternity leave and the adequacy of in, uh, paternity leave is something that has been shown to work in many Scandinavian countries. So I think we should start to push from two weeks to three weeks to four weeks at the, as a start, right? And then gradually to equalize. Okay. Have the two weeks made any difference and does it give us any hope to kind of go further? We have seen men take the full two weeks. Okay. We have seen men say two weeks was hardly enough for me to become helpful to my wife and my kid. The people, there will be a big bunch of people who won't take it at all. But there will be people who actually want to. And men will follow men. If they see other men do it, if they see the boss do it, they will continue to do it. They, they will all jump on the bandwagon. So I think we should think about doing that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your theory of change, Karina. OK, any more? OK, I guess it's back to you. I hope you uh, want to pick up on something that Karina said on paternity leave. Well, so please do. Uh, well, Real quick so, one before we wrap. So it's, it's rather interesting uh, that we, we, we came to this question because actually this was a question that we asked um, a lot of our union brothers and sisters during our Every Worker Matters conversations. Does it matter? And actually it was quite split down the middle. Some people say, yeah, but paternity leave, right? But the father, right, probably would still, you know, go out and play golf. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that, that, there was that, but there were also others, exactly like what Karina had mentioned, that, yeah, I want to be able, right, to be enabled and uh, empowered to be able to help my wife during that period. So, so what's the level that will really tip the balance for you? What do you think I it is? actually think, right, is the best person for the job. Oh. Yeah, so it's not so much whether it's paternity or maternal leave, it's just childcare leave, you know, and you share it. Okay. Yeah. So make it possible for either mother exactly, or father to exactly. do it. Exactly, and every family's dynamics um, is different. But I think it's also important that men, you do know that you need to share your caregiving burden, okay? Okay. So we're going to wrap. We started off recognizing the disruptions to the world of work. I'd like you to just come back to the question of how at the end of the day, you feel one or two things need to be done in order to refresh and strengthen the social compact that we have from workers to businesses to communities and families and society. What is one or what are one or two things that you want to see done that will really strengthen or refresh this social compact for Singapore? That we have sustainable livelihoods for workers, that society is cohesive and that the economy serves everyone who wants to work. Bear in mind, we've not discussed the disabled and yes. we certainly have not paid a lot of attention to the bottom 20% in Singapore. So wrap it up, one link, please kick us off. Well, I've, I've talked about this a lot just now. I actually think um, we need to ride with the wind of what happened, the, the tailwinds that we got during COVID-19. Okay. with the introduction of flexible work arrangements globally. We need to make sure it's sustainable. We need to make sure right, that it's fairly operationalized. I do believe right, that being able to redesign your work, being able right, to fully embrace flexible work arrangements will really be the kicker in transforming Singapore's workplace and economy. Thank you. In turn. Thank you, Julian. Um, if I can just allude to two things. One is looking at not just a compassionate meritocracy, but one that is inclusive and representative as well, ensuring that we include um, people from various different backgrounds uh, and changing also the way that we performance evaluate and appraise them, bearing in mind the different circumstances and um, social networks or social 
um, capital that they may have or come from. Second is beyond policies and frameworks such as those, um, what we do in our home, within our families, how we demonstrate um, diversity, uh, e equity, equality, uh, qualities that we want to have in our children as we raise them. Uh, for example, even the responsibilities in the family between mothers and fathers, that it shouldn't just be the mother and the girls who cook in the kitchen or serve the food, but uh, fathers taking on uh, increasingly more responsibilities. And then it's not just the father who always goes out to work, but mothers too, they have yes. the careers that they want to pursue. And, uh, so, okay. you know, we can have uh, policies, legislation, frameworks, but what also matters is what we do from home. Uh, because um, our children grow up, you know, doing things that they see and what they observe okay. you know, from the family first. Yeah. Thank you, Intan. Rajiv, your so closing thoughts. Passionate I... meritocracy uh, is, you know, you have to understand that in any organization, as I said, the 2060 20 bell curve will be there. Compassionate meritocracy, in my opinion, is allowing people to choose where on the curve they want to uh, contribute and paying them accordingly. Uh, it's not going to be achieved by trying to do the same thing again and again every year and hoping for a different result, which according to Einstein was the uh, definition of insanity. We cannot push everybody on the right. We have to legitimize the curve and allow people to choose how much they want to contribute and pay accordingly. That is called, to my opinion, comp uh, you know, compassionate meritocracy. Uh, we ignore the genius of Pareto and the genius of Einstein by doing the same thing again and again and okay. hope that things will change. You've heard sort of thoughts here. There are huge business costs and change management attending to what we hope to achieve. Where is that going to come from or who's going to stump up? You think that businesses in Singapore are prepared for that? Absolutely. I think, uh, again, you cannot impose tariffs on businesses. Okay. I think that there's a limit to how much tariff businesses already pay taxes. What we were trying to, what I was trying to say is that this is going to be a win-win for both business and society. Okay. Your productivity goes up if you give people freedom and trust. Okay. And we've mathematically proven that. Uh, so it's, it's not about you know, imposing costs. It's about actually doing right by society and doing right by shareholder. Okay. Uh, one leads to the other. Mm. On that note, I hope you will agree that we've had a very engaging session, that there are many uh, sort of points to take on. And actually, as Intan pointed out, it's up to us to change it within our families before we can even get it in our firms and beyond. So please join me in thanking uh, our panelists this afternoon. 